Well, thanks very much. Um, I want to try and address what I think um, is a pretty serious, and maybe more serious than, than, than I thought anyway, uh, situation uh, in relation to the publication of the, uh, the Silver Report. Because there are, there are issues uh, in relation to his conclusions. More importantly, how he arrived at those conclusions, what he based the conclusions on, and the material, the, generally the material that he uh, was presented with, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming uh, that he was presented with the material. He didn't go and look for it, he, it was presented to him. Now, I want to just uh, give a, this is my own analysis of the, of the De Silva report. I'm, I'm going to stick to the De Silva report uh, tonight. And uh, 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 there's a lot I think I've left out of it because it's such a vast uh, document and there's such a, a large uh, number of issues that, 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 that he addressed and that we all addressed over the years. But let me start first of all by stating that without doubt the most important conclusion made by De Silva was that the FRU did not know that the UDA was targeting PAD. Now, in my view, this conclusion actually exonerates Frew for any part in Pat's murder. And Frew's the, the Force Research Unit, which was the British Army Agent Handling Unit in existence at the time of the murder. And paragraph, page 400 414 of Volume 1 of the Silvery states at paragraph 21.209, he, uh, cha he challenges uh, Judge Corey and says, having considered and analysed a great deal of more evidence than was available to Justice Corey, I must respectfully differ with inferences he draws in relation to the Frew's prior knowledge of the targeting of Patrick Finnegan. I am firmly of the view that in this instance Nelson withheld critical information from his handlers. Now, if Frew is believed by De Silva to have had no targeting information on, on Pat Finnegan, then there was no such information to pass up the chain of command to the very top. And this is a military unit after all. Now, um, Ed Maloney actually gave a, a very good analysis of this uh, issue in his online blog uh, a while back. And he referred to Nelson's journal, which gave an account of how Nelson passed all information from the UDA to his handlers in Fru, including the targeting of Pat Finnegan. Now, it's true that Nelson shifts around a bit on different occasions about whether he passed on information or not, but this issue alone should be enough to justify the establishment of a public inquiry because there is credible suspicion that Nelson did pass on such information to Frew. There are also allegations that Frew people were helping in the targeting of Pat. So the De Silva review is one man's analysis of a large amount of material, and he has been selective. It is impossible to arrive at the truth unless this material is provided and analysed by others who have an interest in the issues. A public inquiry with a number of interested parties would allow these interested parties to pursue their own theories and use the relevant material provided to make their own analysis. Now, there are serious concerns, certainly I have serious concerns, about the authenticity of much of the documentation that he refers to in his report. There's no indication in the report as to how he validated the documents he examined. And this is one uh, of my main objections anyway to the De Silva process. He has gone into minute detail by analysing the documents, particularly the contact forms uh, of the FRU and other intelligence documents, without taking a view that some may not be genuine. He has then reached conclusions that may not be true. More importantly, he makes the assertion that he used the intelligence documents, or some of them anyway, as a yardstick to test the validity of other material. And he says that he had, he says he had the advantage of having contemporaneous intelligence records. He doesn't say, say how he knew they were contemporaneous, and it would be difficult to know unless you ask questions. Now, at, at page 390 of volume one, he states, as with all intelligence material, the above information is necessarily limited in its evidential value, though I have not seen any material to suggest there are any doubts 
as to the accuracy of this information. So he's been presented with this material. He doesn't ask anybody else about it apart from his own team. And he comes to that conclusion that he doesn't see any evidence that there's anything wrong with the documentation. Now Judge Corey, who published his report in April 2004, he examined material and some of the same material and he was assured that he was furnished with all the information that might bear on the issues he was examining and on that basis he was satisfied that his review was as comprehensive as possible. However, as De Silva stated in his report, Judge Corey did not get all the material he was assured he would get. He doesn't say why. He doesn't say why Corey and even John Stevens didn't get this material. He got it. He was given it. As soon as he came into this to the review, he was, he was given material that they didn't get. In chapter 11, at page 250, De Silva refers to new information that has come to light, but he doesn't say what it is. He refers to contact forms and the security force, the security services compendium of leaks, as it's called, published in 1989, but he doesn't make it clear if this is what he means by new information. Contact for forms are also uh, examined by Corey. Interestingly, Judge Corey's document review was similar to De Silva's in that they both had no power to subpoena witnesses nor to require the production of documents and other material. At least Corey didn't claim to find the truth about what happened because he was clear that conflicts of evidence, which he found, could only be resolved by examining witnesses in a public inquiry. He set out the areas where he could not make any findings. This is Corey, Dr. Judge Corey. He set out the areas where he, he could not make any findings and stated that only a public inquiry where documents and witnesses could be examined could resolve the conflicts and arrive at conclusions. In other words, a review of documents, although useful, was not the end of the matter. Judge Corey's task was to determine if there was a prima facie case that collusion existed. And his report was far shorter, resulting in about, I think it was 115 pages, compared with De Silva's 800 odd pages. De Silva took the view that the papers that he examined were authentic, which in my view makes it a fundamentally flawed process. In terms of size, the report is certainly formidable, but he has given us snippet upon snippet of carefully selected material, and unless all the material is examined, or as much as is legally possible to examine, it is impossible to form a view. He refers to many documents, but annexes only a few. He has picked extracts from others, and he doesn't say why. He refers to certain documents, and we are not permitted to read these documents in full, let alone challenge the contents. Nor were we entitled to examine any of the original documents. He refers to documents that we did not know existed. Basically, he has read the documents and come to his own conclusions about the content. <coughs> he has referred to many documents that we have not seen, as if he was the only person who could make sense of them and come to the truth about them. Some of these, as he says, he has redacted and annexed, but most have just, have just been referred to in footnotes. We don't know what other material he has examined. Where is the rest of it? Is the question I ask. In view of the fact that there exist over a million pages of documents, he has to be selective. However, we have not been told how he selected the material. There is no explanation for failing to disclose the material. We don't know how many pages of material exists. Over a million could mean closer to two million. And documents can be verified. Authenticity can be verified. There's a forensic way of doing this. Documents have to be examined in the context, in the, in the context of other documents, and you have to know what to look for. And I think that's crucial. If you're examining documents like this, you need to know what to look for. If, for example, we suspect that a document is forged, we can have the original examined by an expert in that field. If we think that uh, the contents of a document are not credible, we can explore by cross-examination. And where interested members of the public can see and hear the witnesses. Now, there's an, there's, an, there's an important issue here, I think, possibly goes to the core of De Silva's report and De Silva's findings, and that is that uh, most of you know this, the, the issues, as I say, and I'm assuming a, a level of knowledge, but Ian Hurst, who is a, a, um, he was a member of FRU, 
uh, and he was also a whistleblower. And he said that the contact forms were forged. And this has to be the starting point in any scrutiny of the bona fides of the documentation that was examined by this review. And I think it has to, I think it has to be a starting point in relation to the bona fides of, of uh, De Silva as well. Because he disregarded uh, Ian Hurst. And it's incomprehensible that De Silva can come to a conclusion about this without a thorough examination of the documents and a proper examination of Ian Hurst, who he dismissed as a Walter Mitty character. When you take into consideration that the Fru had a year to sort out the documents, this whole area needs examined. This was highlighted in, John, in John's panorama programme, and it took a threat to arrest the GOC General Waters to get Nelson's intelligence material, and the contact forms weren't produced to the Stevens team for nearly a year. And Hurst said that the Fru had the material during this time and they were doctoring it. As highlighted in Panorama, Stephen's team thought that the documents were tampered with as well. So, um, and, and, and by the way, Hurst is no Walter Mitty, Mitty character. Because I met him in Dublin uh, a few years ago and was introduced by Greg Harkin. And Her, Her, Hurst would be a, a crucial witness in a public inquiry, but De Silva dismissed him without even seeing him. Now, he only saw about 11 or 12 people altogether during this process, during his review process. But this crucial witness, in my view, he didn't even see him. And uh, in my view, this in itself raises the issue of the cover-up of collusion. It is the accountability escape route, as I call it. If, for example, there was incriminating material in the Nelson and the Frew documents, the recordings, the transcripts of the meetings between the handler and the agent, there was plenty of time to get rid of it or change it. And I think this goes right to the heart of the matter. And the fact that the Stevens investigation eventually got the through documentation and there was no reference to the targeting of Pat and no reference to Pat at all until the morning after the murder when Nelson phoned Margaret Walshaw, his handler. And I think all this is very suspicious. Now, I don't know why De Silva didn't think that this was all very suspicious. And I don't know why De Silva didn't recommend that there should be a public inquiry. And he has his remit, and that's not part of his remit. But all the same, this is, this is a serious issue in which you've got a witness who says that the documentation was doctored. And he, find, he comes to a conclusion that... Uh, there, he comes to a conclusion that Fru didn't know about the targeting of Pat, and that absolves everybody in that, in that uh, chain of command. So, what, what, we have, what we have now at a, uh, is this, that at a public inquiry, which I'm pretty sure will come eventually, Ian Hurst would not, not be the only witness on the issue, as there are other Fru members including the commanding officers and those up the very short chain of, chain of command who could deal with this particular issue. And many of them made statements to the Stevens team. Now, it's inconceivable, it's inconceivable I think, that this plot was not known to the Fru. They must have known about it, and they must have known Nelson would be in the thick of it as the chief intelligence officer and, as, as De Silva tells us, their only loyalist agent. So, Nelson was the only loyalist agent of, of, of the Fru, and, that, so, and, and, and he didn't know about it, or didn't, he, he, well, De Silva says that Nelson knew about it, but he didn't pass it on to Fru. And that's nonsense, I think. So, questions about this would be asked at a public inquiry. It can't be just put into a report and then come to a conclusion based on the paperwork. So it's not believable. I, I, I don't believe that the Fru didn't know about this plot, and I don't believe that Nelson didn't pass on the information to them about the targeting of Pat. Now, in my view, it's believable that they knew, they knew about it through Nelson, and it's believable that they helped Nelson with targeting Pat, as they did with targeting other people. And it's believable that they directed the murder and that they doctored the documentation to remove all reference to the targeting of Pat Finnegan and to paint a benevolent picture of the Fru's links with Nelson. Now, 
is the issue here that John has mentioned about the gap, <clears throat> the gaps, let's say, about what I would call circumstantial evidence to a certain extent, but there's the important issue about of, of how far up the chain of command did the plot go. Now, the Frew had a chain of command. It's not just the Frew's chain of command. The chain of command went directly up to the top of the government to the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. That's the chain of command. And it was a very short chain of command, by the way, because there were very few links in the chain. You had the agent, you had the Frew handler, then you had the OC of the particular debt, and then you had the OC of Frew going up the chain of command. Then you had the commander of land forces, you had the general officer commanding, then you had the defence minister, and then to the Joint Intelligence Committee chaired by Margaret Thatcher in London. Now, that's not a big chain of command, that's not a lot of people. So, due to the fact that according to De Silva, Nelson was the British Army's only loyalist agent, and that he reported to his handlers on a weekly basis. His weekly FRU reports could easily be dealt with at the weekly Joint Intelligence Committee meetings in London, chaired by Thatcher. It is inconceivable that Nelson was not a focus at, the, at these meetings. He's the only loyalist agent. So when they come along to the, when, to, to, to the uh, Joint Intelligence Committee to talk about loyalists, who do they talk about? Brian Nelson. And what was he doing? So it's inconceivable that Thatcher didn't know about this and the Cabinet who were involved in this Joint Intelligence Committee. And this was weekly meeting. And Nelson met with his handlers on a weekly basis. So there are, in my view, there are numerous inconsistencies in the report that can't be left on the shelf. Now, there's a number of there's a number of uh, minor issues, I think, but I think they're important enough, but they haven't been explained. And, and, and for example, De Silva says Fru was founded in 1982. De Silva finds that, says that, states that. But other authors, uh, there's but Mark Urban, for example, in Big Boy's Rules, he quotes the CLF Glover, who says he established Fru in 1980 to form a triumvirate with the 14th Intelligence Unit and the SAS. Corey says, and this is another inconsistency in relation to, to Brian Nelson, Corey says that in 1985, Brian Nelson walked in off the street to offer his services to the British Army as an agent. And that's page 24 of the Corey report. Whereas De Silva says, quoting Brian Fitzsimmons, special branch leader in the RUC, appear, he says that appears not to have become involved in paramilitary activity until May 1984, when he contacted the army to offer his services as a source of intelligence. And then you've got uh, this uh, fairly uh, well-known uh, army officer, Br Brigadier Arundel Leakey, uh, who is a director of military operations in the Ministry of Defence, and he filed an affidavit in a court case in London in injunction proceedings, and he says, he says, in 1983, Nelson offered his service to the army as an agent in the UDA. Now, this document, the Leakey documents and affidavit, it's not referred to in De Silva, it's not referred to at all in De Silva or, or, in, the, or in the Corey report, but it was published in the Sunday Tribune in 2002. So this is, a, this is a, I think it's a small enough example of the limited nature of the De Silva process. He was limited by the for, by the virtue of, ter, of his terms of reference, but he doesn't see these, it seems, or he certainly doesn't refer to them as inconsistencies. And the only way that you can uh, explore and examine inconsistencies like this is to get the documentation to the people who are interested in reading it and who are interested who have an interest in the proceedings and also get the relevant witnesses and have them put forward for questioning about these inconsistencies. And you can't do that. The paper review's over. He's looked at the papers. We haven't seen them. We've seen a few, few things. Paper review's over. He's put his review on the shelf. That's the end of it, he thinks. So the question here is, what is the truth of the recruitment of Brian Nelson? And what is the truth about the formation of Fru? And Corey says... Uh, at this time, this is another interesting point, at this time Nelson was a member of the UDA and acting as an intelligence officer for that organisation, West Belfast. But De Silva says, despite his previous conviction for involvement in serious sectarian violence, the Fru tasked Nelson with rejoining the UDA. 
and he's quoting from Nelson's journal. So, was he already in the UDA when he offered his services, or was he tasked with rejoining the UDA after offering his services? Now, these are important issues because the suspicion is that he was a, so that he was a soldier and then a UDA sectarian killer, and that these credentials made him a very good candidate for targeting Catholics or Republicans. So, the question again is, and there's a lot of common knowledge about this, but this, was this the continuation of the classic uh, Kitsonian death squad? In other words, a British military unit using local agents as killers while funding and supporting them and directing them. This has to be examined in a public way. It can't sit now on uh, De Silva's shelf. Now, there's a suspicion by many that Nelson never left the British Army. And when he went to Germany in 1985, it was not to get away from the UDA, but to train with the British Army in Germany before his reintroduction in a more specialised system. And when it is alleged he came back to Belfast from Germany in 1987, is it a coincidence that this coincided with the shipment of modern weaponry from South Africa to arm loyalists in a revived murder campaign against Catholics and Republicans? There are many questions to be asked about this. The report can't sit on the shelf. De Silva came to the conclusion that Nelson was not involved in the South African arms shipment in 1987, even though he accepts that Nelson travelled to South Africa in 1985 and discussed arms shipments to the north. But there is an interesting issue about <coughs> Nelson's trip to South Africa, which I think goes to the bona fides of Mr De Silva. Judge Corey states that Frew paid Nelson's expenses for the trip but De Silva doesn't mention that at all in his report. He d doesn't mention it. Judge Corey says the expenses for the trip were paid for by Fru to go to South Africa. De Silva doesn't think that's important, or does he? Does he think it's important? Is that why he left it out of the report? But it's left out of the report. So that needs answered. Why did he leave it out of the report? So, in the absence of this crucial bit of information from De Silva report, it's very, very significant, and that needs explored. And the whole issue about the South African uh, connection needs explored in a public way, in a public inquiry, because there are issues that even De Silva hasn't explained properly, and there are issues about De Silva. So, this is another example of De Silva exonerating Fru, and thus the British government, in the murders of Catholics and Republicans post-1987. Nelson remained in his targeting role up until his arrest in 1990. This whole issue would be closely examined at a public inquiry where one document would lead to another and all interested parties would be entitled to examine all the documentation as well as cross-examine the relevant witnesses. None of that happened during the De Silva process, and I've said that. But there's so much information and misinformation in the public domain about Pat's murder. There has to be public clarification. It can't be allowed to be swept under the carpet by Cameron and De Silva. Now, this is just a short narrative of what I think are important areas I've just covered that haven't been properly examined in this review process and which cannot be examined properly until all the documentation is furnished, not just snippets and footnotes. Now, I'm just going to refer to a few examples here of some other important issues that I would, you know, wouldn't have time. I, I mean, I could stay here for a week on, on this stuff, but the following examples are some of the important areas that needs a thorough examination of public forum, where there's no hiding place. The role of the RUC in Pat's murder, for example, from the death threats to solicitors in Castle Ray and the other holding centres, to which Pat actually bore the brunt, to the RUC briefing to Douglas Hogg, by Jack Herman, with false information about Pat's family members. De Silva published what he says is intelligence material about this. The detail of the contact between the special branch and Fru is crucial and requires a full public examination. That whole relationship needs to be put into the open, needs to be uh, shaken up and put into the public domain. And these people who have never been accountable in all the years, never been accountable. They need to be brought in, they need to be questioned, they need to be examined, and they need to be made accountable. Now, <clears throat> another thing which uh, uh, I, I want to refer to, which I find that's just fairly objectionable, is he published what he calls intelligence, which alleges that Pat laundered money for the IRA in the firm where we, we've worked closely together for 10 years. 
I know this to be completely untrue, but I don't know who concocted it, and questions need to be asked about that. He also published allegations that Pat was a finance officer and an intelligence officer in the IRA. He cleverly makes it clear that there is no evidence that Pat was involved with the IRA. But I think what's interesting about that is that De Silva published documents in Volume 2 of his report which alleged just that. It didn't redact them. And I think this is a cynical exercise in deception, and there can be no excuse for it, in my view. He should not have published this material because there was no mechanism in the process for the family members, or me for that matter, to challenge it. He published it, maybe gave somebody a nod or a wink, said, oh, Pat Finucane wasn't in the IRA, but have a look at that. And I find that, I find that objectionable and inexcusable. <coughs> There's also the fact that there was a, an RUC special branch file on Pat, which seems to have been packed with fact and fiction, at least what he published. Questions need to be asked about how false information got into this file. And there are a, there are a large number of other areas that need to be uh, dealt with and explained and examined in a public way. There's an inconsistency, for example, in Gordon Kerr's role. And volume, and, and, and volume 1 refers to Corey's analysis of Kerr's testimony as misleading. Corey says Kerr's testimony is misleading and also referred to the highly dubious numerical analysis. De Silva challenges Corey and goes into a lengthy analysis of the Frew documentation, again accepting their authenticity, and said that his analysis takes him in a different direction to that of Corey. In other words, he says Corey got it wrong. And another area that needs, needs looked at very carefully is the role of government ministers who are cleared by De Silva on the basis that the paperwork showed that ministers were not included in some of the distribution lists. That needs examined in public. So I just want to um, finish here with a comment on perception. According to the Mail Online on the 25th of September 2009, Sir Desmond de Silva is a member of the Carlton Club, St James Street, London. Now, the club was bombed by the IRA on the 25th of June 1990. Lord Cabery, who was injured in the attack, died in March 1981. Douglas Hogg is a member of this club, as is Margaret Thatcher, John Major, Boris Johnson and other Tory notables. Past members were Winston Churchill and Ted Heath. The club describes itself as the oldest, most elite and most important of all conservative clubs. Membership of the club is by nomination and election only. He is also a member of the Naval and Military Club and Brooks Club. So, so there you have it. Cameron obviously cared little that there might be a perception that the appointment of such an individual to carry out the review might be biased in some way. And I don't know this, just to finalise that, I don't know how many times throughout this report De Silva refers to what he calls, and it's in quotes, a full public account. He refers to his, his full public account. So, first of all, it's not a full account, it's definitely not a public account, and it's flawed in its failure to authenticate documentation that is not anywhere near an account of the truth. So, David Cameron made a statement in the House of Commons on the 12th of October 2011 that the really important thing is to open up and tell the truth. But I'm afraid the truth will have to wait for another day. Thank you.